Hello. Hopefully, yeah, everyone can hear me. Uh, this has been that the morning or afternoon from hell. I don't mind using that word. Nothing worked. Nothing. Not my internet connection, not my cell phone. Uh, that's why I didn't log on or send you the guys the log on information at my usual 245, 250. I barely got. Some of you may have noticed I haven't had time to shave. It's been a nightmare. Nothing, everything stopped working. Something about 3G, I don't even know what that means. I've heard about 5G interfering with airplanes, but my cell phone stopped working. My landline wasn't working. My internet connection all at once. So I don't think there's anyone else that's joined yet. Yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, it says admit all. Wait a minute. I hit, the, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Admit all. Whoops. Whoa, whoa. I, I'm just frazzled right now because, <laughs> yeah, okay. you, you can imagine everything. <laughs> okay. I don't understand why it's not letting people in. See, this is malfunctioning too. You know, Zoom malfunction. We know, right? Was that was that my evening class? Why, yeah, you why? could restart the Zoom meeting with a new. Oh no, never mind. People are coming in. No, thank you, thank you. <laughs> It's one of those yeah, days where the <laughs> high tech world just stops functioning properly. Everything is joining us. I'm not exaggerating. My cell phone, my landline, my yeah. uh, internet connection, the website for the college. I couldn't access any of that until just now. Something about 3G versus 5G. I don't even know what those terms mean. I have no idea. I know I pay my bills for everything on time. So I was on the phone with AT&T trying to figure out why I had no service because my uh, internet connection may have been caught up in that too. Zoom malfunction, was that it? I can't remember, it was on Monday. I think it was the evening class. I had to resend the invitation. Was that this class? I don't think so. Now that's a Zoom function, uh, malfunction, whatever, malfunction. But this was worse. This was like the entire high tech, you know, connections to the world in my house stopped working until just now okay so let's see we got elijah good timing so i don't want to bore you with any details but notice that i haven't shaved there's a reason i barely had time to catch my breath and switch gears to get you guys uh, logged in let's see is anybody else waiting to enter okay the good news is we'll end a little early today we were going to anyway but we are going to cover two new slides. As you can see, if you've been following the last two on this week's topic, they're both really interesting. And there's a, a bit of a controversial, this is not really the right word. When you go back to the ancient world, by modern standards, everything was controversial. Uh, but in terms of the, let's say, the behavior of the rulers of ancient Assyria and Babylon towards animals. You'll see what I mean when we do the meaning on the last two slides. So when we get through that, then you can take a brief kind of breather while I show you. It's only going to be about a dozen slides from the Louvre Museum in Paris, which has one of the largest collections outside the Middle East of ancient Near Eastern art. You know, they used to have colonies there when those that, right? And I guess whatever, Napoleon or some other rulers of France just decided it was their right to take everything they wanted to back to Paris. And that's where those, some of those things are. And since that's where they are, and, and I had friends in Paris and, you know, we, we took photos. I'll show you just like 10 or 12 for just your own information. And you want to take notes. Then we will finish up. This is a really important subject with uh, how to write your papers. And you should all have that handout. I did send that out before everything crashed and stopped working, uh, which is this handout. We will get to it after the slides, the, the remaining must know slides. <laughs> there we go. And I'll go through each of those five albums. But we should still end several minutes early today, maybe 10 or 15 minutes early. But I will stick around for any questions that you guys have. OK, so let's uh, go to the slides with the screen share, they're just two must know ones, right? And um, we will do this in the order of which they are the last two slides on this week's uh, week three. Okay, can you guys see this? It's important. You can see this, I hope is this. Yep. Oh, good, thank you. Because the way things have been going today, <laughs> it could be yet a new glitch. Okay, good, here we go. This is the title of this slide. Asher Nazarpal 
long name. I know I'll spell it for you. Asher Nazarpal, Killing Lions, plural. Okay, so the location is Nimrod. Well, that's actually an insult in uh, Yiddish. <laughs> I'm sorry, my Jewish friends pointed that out to me. But it's a town in Iraq too, N-I-M-R-U-D, Iraq. So the location, in other words, if this is on the test, on the midterm, which it could be, um, then you would need to get full credit on the answer to put both the city and the country. The only reason is there are a whole bunch of these panels, Bobberly, if you want to describe what this is and what's going on in just a moment, all over the Middle East and, and even specifically in that museum where this is, uh, it, it's a British museum in London, but the museum in Babylon has it too, uh, Babylon, Baghdad, sorry, Baghdad. Uh, there, there are hundreds of these, of these hunting panels so we have to distinguish which one. So again, the date is 850 BC or BCE. Let's now uh, spell his name. A-S-S-U-R-N-A-S-I-R-P-A-L. Of course, you have yourself this, so it should be in front of you here. Okay, good. We're just starting with this uh, first must know slide. Okay, so again, Asher, Nazarpal, Killing Lions, Nimrod or Nimrud, I guess is how in the Middle East pronounce the word is the city. N-I-M-U-R, sorry, N-I-M-R-U-D, Iraq and 850 BC. So what is this? First of all, it's a bas-relief panel. That, that should be pretty clear, right? Because we defined bas-relief uh, in the last lecture and I gave you the definition. Uh, so, and that could easily appear on the midterm. You see the raised figures here, right? And it's made out of stone. Actually, it's a kind, you don't have to know what kind, but it's sandstone, it has the color of sand. Uh, it's almost like very hardened sand. But anyway, it's a, just a stone bow relief panel, which is about one third life size. This is all part of the meaning. And it's depicting the uh, then ruler, right? At that time, current ruler, of Assyria, and that's an important distinction. Even though where it was created today is the country of Iraq, back then it wasn't part of Babylon. It was a separate kingdom that conquered the whole Middle East. And you may have heard of them. They were brutal. They were even by ancient world standards, they were excessively cruel to every group of, of uh, people they conquered. Uh, but they were short-lived because of their cruelty. They were the A, uh, as with a capital A, of course, just like the modern country, but with a capital A. A-S-S-Y-R-I-A-N. Again, you don't have to worry about the spelling. Words not on the syllabus, but you should get that right in your notes. The Assyrian Empire ruled over almost all of the Middle East for less than 150 years. Now, in the ancient world, that's not a long time. Many empires lasted several hundred years and some over a thousand uh, the Egyptians for 3,000. So, so it was a short-lived, brutal uh, empire, warlike and extremely cruel is the main point to everyone they conquered, including the Jews and, you know, ancient Israel, uh, other Arabic tribes, the Turks, you know, uh, they, they even got their empire into what part of what's now southern Turkey. It was a big empire. So this was their emperor, Asher Nazarbal. It should be obvious he's the guy with a bow and arrow in a chariot who's Quote, hunting lions. Well, here's what I, I like to say. You, you wouldn't necessarily have to remember this or even write it in your notes, but it might help you if when this, if I'm saying, if this slide is on the midterm. I like to say that if you look at his spelling of his name, the first three letters, A-S-S, -S, say what he was. And there's a reason why I say that, because of the outrageous behavior we're witnessing. It is not a hunting scene. That's what it's being promoted as. This is a piece of political propaganda. That's not a bad phrase to put in your notes, because that literally is what we're looking at. Someone uh, carved it on orders from the king or, you know, one of his ministers to show him off as this great, brave hunter you know, like a sportsman just out risking his life to hunt lions. That's not what's going on at all. It's a complete uh, ruse or, or, or fake, however you want to call that. Uh, th this, this is a misrepresentation, the, the title of it, which we know was translated from a, a Syrian. So we know that's what they, roughly the phrase that, that was used to describe these panels. Whoever the current emperor of that empire, Assyria, 
and the Babylonians did it too. So it wasn't just the Assyrians, many other ancient Middle Eastern empires, but especially the Assyrians. This is what they really did. Here's what we're really seeing. These lions were captured in the wild by his uh, soldiers. Then they were deprived both food and water for a week is what I've read, but just many, just say several days until they were in weakened, of course, very weakened condition. Then they were brought to an arena where this so-called great hunter, the emperor, would have one more bit of uh, unfair advantage in that his soldiers would sever the tendons in the hind legs of these animals before releasing them. <laughs> and if that's not enough, the emperor used poison tip arrows. So is that a fair contest? That's not a hunt, that's a massacre. That's, that's animal abuse, that's how I'd put it. Uh, you read it however you want. Uh, that's what really was happening in these contests. We know that because there's records from that period where we found uh, you know, enough evidence to show that these animals were weakened to the point of where they had maybe one or two last death roars left like this one is. He's you know, obviously literally about to succumb to the poison arrows, but out of the last ounce of strength the lion has left, it's of course in, in, in pain, agony even, and anger making one last attempt to uh, subdue its, its tormentor. And the tormentor is the king, the emperor, Asher Nezibal. That's why I say the first three letters of his name describe what he is to me based on this behavior. Here's, here's a line that's already had its you know, uh, moment and is, is literally in the last seconds probably of its life. It's already been you know, starved, deprived water, poisoned arrow shot through and of course the hind, hind legs hind leg tendons i meant uh have have been severed so it can't really do more than maybe one or two leaps and not very far so so there's no in other words there's no e even contest here this is not a hunt this is not sports it's a massacre of animals that are not defenseless but pretty close so that's what's really going on but again remember that that wasn't the message that the artist was told to convey and that this would have been displayed in a public place, probably displayed in the palace. And uh, that would have been the message in other words would have been, oh, look at our brave king, our brave emperor. He's risking death to, you know, hunt lions. And of course, sometimes lions obviously attack humans. So, oh, maybe he's protecting us or, or he's at least he's showing off this is the message, underlying message intended for this piece. And all the other hunting, uh, lion hunting, and there was always lions, it seems, that they used in these uh, bas-relief panels of uh, hunting scenes in the ancient Near East, was, oh, the, our king is such a brave, a great, you know, sportsman. And just the opposite is, is really what the truth was. Okay. So you get the meaning, although if it's not obvious, these guys here, of course, we'll get up close, are dressed uh, as his uh, body, personal bodyguards would be. They were the ones protecting him. So they were the ones that made sure the lions were weakened, like I just told you how they did that. And in case the lion, actually, there's even a fifth, if you, if you add them up, that's five uh, cards, or however you want to say that, uh, aspects of this that are uh, stacked against the lions. They followed within a, a, a couple of feet of the lions and they could easily, and they had poison tip swords. They could easily have immobilized the lion from behind. If he got too close to the brave emperor, <clears throat> they would take him out. So, so there, was, there was no contest here, no, no chance for the lions whatsoever. All right, um, there's one more thing about the meaning and that's a technique for depicting space. We're gonna segue of course now into the formal analysis. Let me take a quick bit of water here. I think some of you already noticed something odd. Let's get up close here about the horses. This is this one horse with three legs and three heads or, or six legs, I should say, and three heads. Of course not. It's supposed to represent three horses side by side, but the artists at this point in time, in this culture at least, didn't know how to depict depth realistically. They knew overlapping and that's it. So let's now do the formal analysis. The meaning, remember, sometimes some elements of composition can overlap like they did with Stonehenge. Remember the notes I gave you on Stonehenge, where the, the height of the, of the stones is part of the meaning of them, the impressive scale and size of them, but is also one of the elements 
of space. So here, let's start with the first of the nine elements we'll, we'll say is space or depth. It's very simple. There's only one technique here, overlapping. The chariot overlaps the bottom of the emperor's body and the legs of this lion, their uh, clothing of, the, of all of the people in the scene uh, and helmets or head headdress, you can say, or headgear, overlap their bodies. And these three horses laughingly, <laughs> my daughter could draw better horses when she was in fifth, uh, kindergarten. Spaghetti legs, she called this when she saw this slide. The horse's legs and heads are supposed to represent three side-by-side -side horses receding in space, but obviously it's very poorly done. Uh, but everything else is pretty well done. And so let's do the formal other, sorry, I meant formal elements, for instance, simulated textures. They're quite good when you get up close. I've seen this piece. Like I said, it's in the British Museum. It's fascinating. Once you know what you're really looking at and the tour guides, I listened. Some of them got it and told what I just told you to the audiences or the, 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 the you know, visitors, the museum visitors and others didn't. They just talked about this great hunter. Anyway, we see simulated texture on the beards, on their uh, uniforms or clothing, if you want to put it that way. And of course, on the chariot and the lions, right hair, and even the horses, uh, though they're not depicted in, in realistic space, in terms of space or depth, uh, they're well done as far as simulated texture. And of course, all of the simulated texture is done with carved line. It's the only kind of line. It's a warm color, sandstone. It's color of sand, so of course it's an earth tone. It's a warm color. I used to say it was mostly stable because the soldiers, the bodyguards behind the emperor, the emperor himself, and uh, the chariot are, are fairly stable. And so is this dying lion here. But when you add up the wheel of the chariot, the charging, one charging lion and the horses, it's, it's a mixture. So obviously you see both a stable and dynamic parts in this composition. The largest mass, well, that's hard to say, but I'd say it's the horses because they, you know, are all shown side by side or supposedly, and they're slightly larger than the lions. And then I would say it's the charging lion looks a little bigger than the dying one. Well, the emperor would be the third largest mass, but you don't see the bottom of half of his body. It's balanced, very carefully balanced. I mean, if you just add up this area here and the front part of the, you know, where the horses are, and then the middle with him standing upright, right up to the near the top of it, down to the bottom where the wheel touches, uh, it's balanced roughly. Uh, that would be left to right, but of course not or balanced or somewhat unbalanced toward the bottom because of the empty space in most of the upper half or much of it. Okay, let's see the modeling. Of course, all bas relief by definition panels or whatever the details and the other techniques, they all have modeling because that's how we can see the figures. Otherwise we wouldn't see any of the objects. And, but here it's from the museum lighting. So you can say the modeling is shown around all the figures, but it comes from the museum lighting. Okay, let's see, am I missing anything? Oh, rhythm, oh yeah, there's powerful rhythm here with the soldiers, helmets. And uh, arms, of course, the uh, two lions with their arms and legs and heads and the three horses side by side. Uh, there's quite a bit of rhythm, powerful rhythm. Okay, I think we've covered everything on this one. So now we'll go to, this is a, uh, a, a sad scene, I'll say that. And it's different in one really important way than any other hunting ritual or sorry not ritual sorry hunting bas relief panel but it's also on yourself this is the last one for this week's topic dying lioness of course that's with two s's just like it sounds two words dying lioness the location here just iraq the country and the date is 650 bc or bce so the first fact to say about it besides it's obvious if it isn't you should write this a bas relief hunting scene but it is a very close up, unusually close up view of a dying animal, specifically a lioness. We'll get to why many historians believe why the artist chose to depict this particular part of a hunting ritual in such detail and in such close range. There's a reason many historians believe that I, I, I also do for that uh, aspect of this work. But before we get to that, the context, 
This was now back to the Babylonians. They had overthrown the Assyrians, kicked them out, and I think wiped them out. In any case, they had you know overthrown the Assyrian Empire and uh, reformed their second new uh, or second sorry uh, empire. Their, their, their golden age or second golden age was around this time when this panel was created. Babylon was the largest city, some say in the world, but definitely in the Middle East, the largest, some say half a million. That, that's not small today, but of course there are so many bigger cities, but there would be very few places on earth that reach that population again until Rome. Rome went way beyond that. We'll get to that. Um, hmm, I don't know why that's popping up. Window security. That's a new one. <laughs> Just assume, let's hope the way they've been going. I'm going to say a silent prayer that no more interruptions happen. It's been that kind of a week. Okay, so let's now say, well, that doesn't tell us a lot about this scene itself, except that it was created by a Babylonian ruler who was, again, the intention of the, you know, commission. We're talking about a commission. Everyone knows what a commission is, right? These pieces were commissioned by the emperor, right, for their own propaganda purposes as I said with the last panel with Asher Nazarbal. So here was another scene, uh, this time a couple hundred years later of a different you know, empire, the Babylonian empire's ruler, you know, the king or emperor of, of, uh, of the latter Babylonian, that's the right way to write, latter Babylonian empire. We, we talked about the earlier one, a thousand years before this. So what's going on here that's different though is this artist chose to emphasize the suffering of this animal. There's no doubt that the artist was looking closely and want us, the viewer wanted us, to see the animal suffering. Here we see the, right, dragging, this lioness is dragging her uh, legs that are now mobilized by probably both having their tendons severed. I already mentioned the same thing happened with the Babylonian hunters. They weren't any less cruel to these animals. Uh, the Assyrians were worse when it came to how they treated captive populations than the Babylonians, according to most evidence. But when it came to animal abuse, they were about on the same level. Almost all the ancient empires were. Uh, and then we see the arrows, which were undoubtedly poison tipped. And we see the lion, lioness literally roaring. It's called the death agony. Some of you know that phrase when um, it can be true for humans, but certainly for animals. It describes the last moments of, of a dying animal's life when it knows it's going to die and it's in pain. Um, if, if it's been, you know, abused and it's dying due to its injuries, it's called the death agony. So this lioness is in her death agony. And we even see the blood. You rarely would see that at one of these hunting panels. Look at it spurting out of the wounds here, uh, including down below out of her belly and out of her shoulder where she's been shot with these poison arrows. So why would, let me just see if anyone has any, again, there's no right or wrong here, but anybody have a, a thought maybe or a guess as to why would an artist show the, such close up in such close up detail, the suffering of an animal like this? Can you think of any reason why? Now we're not talking about the emperor's agenda. We're talking about what an artist might have thought as to why would they show, want us to notice this? animal suffering. Anybody? Well, I'd say, well, um, go ahead. I, I would say from like, obviously the commissioner, right? The um, king or whatever, they wanted to like strike fear into the people or something, but he's this great hunter, right? Powerful. Yeah, man. that's the agenda for the ruler. But what about, do you think this artist might have had a slightly different per message that he or she was trying to- Maybe do? the artist wanted to Go ahead. Maybe they wanted to focus. You're fading in and out. Say it again. Animal? I, th I think the you animal got it. would bring to the ruler. Sorry, it sounds like two people who both are on the right track or what I was trying to get at. But can one of you or both of you say that again? Because it's like the internet connection must be at your end. Mine says yeah. it's fine. Say it again, please. Um, I think maybe the artist wanted to focus on like what the effect was on the animal yes. rather than what the yes. animal would bring yes. to the ruler. They wanted us to, uh, if the, the historians believe this, this artist deliberately chose to depict the suffering in such detail that the artist very, just say maybe, or I'm going to say probably, probably wanted us to identify with the animal suffering. It's an, you know, obviously 
hopeless thing. The animal's not going to survive with all the cards they say stacked against it that I already described. It has yeah, no. Yeah, the hind legs are also like crippled too. I feel yeah. like you wouldn't want to display the tendons being like. Yeah. It's obvious that this like animal is not willing to fight. Right. Uh, it is not able. Not able, able to. Able. Not able to. Right. Yeah. So, so that would indicate that the artist might have had some empathy, and you know what? If the king figured that out, I think that artist's career would end pretty quickly, <laughs> along with their life. Uh, I'm watching the Tudors, if you know that 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 period of English history. We're not going to get that far in this class, but if you take 1.2 or 2.2, you will. The Renaissance in England, Ooh, the cruelty of the ruling class in England at that time towards anybody that criticized the king. Well, if this guy was making a, the artist, I'm talking about, if this artist was think... making, oh, sorry, go ahead, please, go ahead. Hello? Seems like we have some- Sorry, can you hear me? My internet's kind of bad. I know, I can um, tell. <laughs> it's not just me, huh? Yeah, go ahead, say it again, please. <laughs> um, my, do you think the artist might have wanted to kind of subvert the king and show that rather this, the show of force Maybe. being heroic? That's quite it possible. Could be cruel the opposite. And uh, yeah. Its own people. Uh huh. I think it's possible because artists supposedly, at least, you know, really, you know, focused, conscious thinking artists of whatever their subject matter is, try to convey some kind of an emotion. And they were hired, or this might have been more than one artist, but we don't know. But whoever the artist or artists were or, or was, I, I think it's a conscious effort to make us identify with the suffering of the animal, which would, as you stated, have this secondary effect of making us less respectful of that king, that he would do this to animals and pretend that he was a brave hunter when just the opposite was true. So it could be kind of a very thinly disguised political a statement or criticism you could just say criticism but like i said if the king was smart enough to figure that out a whole bunch of kings were depicted that way by their own court painters in the renaissance and they didn't get it so the painters got away with it and continued working and showing sarcastic sarcastic details in the faces of the kings they were portraying and some of these kings egos were so big they didn't get it which is risky for the artist we don't know that but we could just say the evidence does point to some kind of conscious effort by the artist to uh, make the viewer focus on the suffering of this animal, which would lead to the conclusion, I, I don't know who that was, it just said that, that you just made, that that could be a, a not too veiled or somewhat veiled, you could say it that way, a criticism of the king as not being that brave after all, which would be the contra or opposite message the king wanted to send. Yeah, this is in the British Museum, and I've seen it uh, three times, and it's so powerful that every time I go up close to it and take a look at it, it it's an emotional, you know experience when you really know what was happening to these creatures okay so that's that's everything about the meaning for this piece uh formal analysis pretty much similar to the last except here there's nothing stable there's not a straight line in it uh, i wouldn't even count the ground it looks like you know that's actually just the bottom of the panel well the edge of the image but the, the lion the arrows right every part of the lion's lioness's body is dynamic there's no straight lines anywhere. This is really good ceramic texture, including on the uh, wounds where the blood is spurting, on the arrows, on the uh, claws uh, and, and shriveled legs, right? Uh, severed tendons with the severed tendons in the back of, of their back legs. I mean, and the, the head, face, nose, right? Ears. It's all done with carved line. And the modeling, again, is, is it just a given. It's always part of any bas relief panel. The lighting from the British, you don't have to know which museum, but it's the British Museum in London that owns it. You can just say the museum lighting creates the uh, the modeling, but that's part of the concept of the, so it is a technique the artist is using. Uh, there really, I guess, is two masses. You could say the lioness and then the arrows. So that's really it. Uh, it is balanced, I would say both ways, depending on where you draw the line. If you draw it roughly halfway from the bottom of the scene, at least, not of the slide, image to the top of the panel i would call it roughly balanced both ways and of course the rhythm is powerful with all the arrows the blood the uh, the legs both the front and the back shriveled legs and of course the features on the face uh and let's see am i forgetting anything oh for space there's only one technique overlapping uh and it's only the arrows in this case that well, you could say the body overlaps the the leg on the far. Yeah, it's missing a little here. See, it's been damaged, but that leg would go here. 
And so eh, I don't even see overlapping there, but definitely the arrows overlap the body of the lion. And you could say the blood overlaps her body as well. Okay, am I forgetting it? I don't think I am. <clears throat> I already mentioned the rhythm. Okay, now I'm going to go forward to actually, I think I need to go backwards to do mm, Oh, the color? Oh, the color, warm. Yeah, I said it's, I, I passed over that quickly, but that's an important part of it. Yes, it's a warmer tone, sand color. Okay, we already covered this, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go very quickly through these slides, because you're going to see the Egyptian ones next week. I know there may be some faster way to do this, but I want to get to uh, something from the beginning. That's just for your own edification, which will be Babylonian works. The Egyptian slides are two weeks from now. Covered that. Here we go. We were covering that on Monday. These are the Babylonian. Uh, it is the, it's called the ancient Near East section of the Louvre Museum. These are massive winged bowls with, uh, remember the gods, we saw the lawgiver god, remember in the uh, Stele of Hammurabi in the last lecture. Well, these uh, two uh, special, gods of Babylonian, ancient Babylonian time. These are from the latter Babylonian empire. These were carved in the six or 700 BC range around the time of the dying lion, this panel we just saw. So it's a second golden age of Babylon or second Babylonian empire when these were created. And they then were even more powerful and ruled more territory than they had in their earlier Babylonian empire. So that's where most of the objects in the Louvre Museum and, and many in the British Museum too, uh, were from that period of the Babylonian culture. So if you go to the Louvre in Paris, I spent a whole day in this wing because I'd already been teaching here. That's why I took these slides. It's amazing. These are 12 feet tall, winged lions, right? There's their wings with the head of the human, almost the head of a, a high priest, uh, uh, as we can see from the beard, an important, very wise you know, entity. Well, these are gods, the kind of god that Babylonians believed in. And they even had uh, the bullhorns coming up around their headdress. It's really a fascinating combination of uh, features from three different types of living creatures, you know, a human head, a bull's body, and wings. <laughs> uh, very specific to the ba uh, ancient Babylonian religion. And so these are 12 feet tall. And uh, they guarded the entrance to one of the largest cities. I don't think it was Babylon. It was, they had several large cities. Babylon was the capital and largest city. So now let's go see. This one interests me. This guy here was definitely a human, a high priest. You can see his body is, you know, the full, right, uh, image of a, an adult male attired in Babylonian, uh, well, I guess you'd say, roy not royal. I'm sorry, I meant a religious. There we go. Religious uh, ceremonial outfit the robes and things, and the beard indicates again his wisdom and importance. But he's got a leather apron on. Can anybody guess why? I think you can see why. If he didn't have a leather apron, I wouldn't uh, bet on how long he could survive. This is a baby lion, maybe knowing what's going to happen to it when it gets older or to it's already happened to its parents. Don't worry, David. This is just my own first thoughts. But obviously, they're, they're probably training this, this, this baby lion for something. Or maybe they're going to kill it with this uh, sap. It's called a sap. Nobody knows what I'm talking about unless you grew up on the streets of Chicago like I did, or New York, or Boston. Back east, and when I was a kid, these things, you, you know, before people got as many, sadly, easily obtainable firearms as they now can, um, the, the one way to, to take out a, an enemy in a fight, not always kill them, but sometimes it could, is you had heavy metal wrapped in leather uh, with a handle, and you could whirl around your head, a little bit like a ninja-type weapon, only it was a pretty severe injury it could cause. That could kill if you hit someone directly in the right place in their head. So I don't know what he's about to do with this poor lion, but he's protecting himself with a leather uh, apron <clears throat> and some kind of religious ritual. And it probably involves sacrificing an animal. Here's another one of those winged bulls. So you can see it from the side now. The wings supposedly were big enough to lift the 2000 pound bull off the ground. So pretty amazing creatures. And then this is the uh, bull-headed columns that they used in their palace. Now, this would have been 
uh, in in Babylon. Um, and these are, you probably could tell, but if it's not obvious, again, you don't have to write any of this. These are not on syllabus, but just for your own interest here. You see the darker parts are what's left of the original piece found in just, you know, shards in a burial or maybe just over, a, you know, ruined palace, you know, buried for thousands of years underground or over 2000 years anyway, probably in the 1800s was when these things were found by archeologists from Europe, of course, going wherever they wanted and taking whatever they felt like back to their home countries. So the original parts that they found in, in you know, broken pieces are the dark section. So most of the column was the original, but they filled in the missing parts with the concrete to make them complete images. And then here we have, these are obviously the heads of two bowls. Now these are just regular bowls. And they like that decorative detail. It's very different than we'll see with the Greek, later on Greek and Roman temples and, and columns that they used. They had very specific three, well, actually four, if you count the late Roman version, four different styles of uh, decorations. They're called capitals on the tops of the columns. With the Babylonians, they put, they didn't have any set styles of columns. They would put different animals on for different temples for different purposes. So these are the bullheaded columns that were in one of the main uh, temples and I'm not sure what city perhaps Babylon and then uh, the last thing we'll see before we switch gears to talk about how to write your papers this is my slide from the Berlin Museum it's a very interesting museum I used to have it on the syllabus as a must know but I figure you have enough already it's called the Ishtar Gate it might be of interest for some of you to check out for your own and you know not well the extra credit or possibly even a paper this is also a reconstruction, but see that implies the whole thing is fake. <laughs> it, it's partially original. So restoration is also uh, probably the better word. But to me, a restoration means the structure was intact. It was just in disrepair. No, it wasn't. It was in pieces in the ground for well over 2000 years. And the original pieces are the darker ones. Can you see, I mean, the lighter ones in this case, the lighter ones. These animals, these bow relief animals are the sacred animals of the Babylonians ladder or second empire. This was the gate through which you had to pass to what was then the largest city probably in the world when Babylon ruled the whole Middle East in its uh, second golden age. And this is a city that Alexander the Great finally conquered. It, it, uh, it, it was, uh, let's just say this gate and the military you know, defenses were so strong that no one ever could overtake this city. No one ever even got into the city during, it was besieged by other invading armies. Finally, Alexander the Great was the one who was able to uh, take over the Babylonian Empire, but that's hundreds of years later. This is from around 575 BC, and Ishtar was one of their many gods, but these animals are sacred animals. We have, uh, um, I believe they're hyenas, <laughs> and then horses and cows. Uh, actually, I know, I'm sorry, it's goats, horses, cows, and, and hyenas. So four different uh, sacred animals depicted on the main gate. And then all of this part from here up is, is a reconstruction by the museum from actual um, you know, evidence that we know this gate looked like. These were 60 foot tall towers. And of course they were manned by archers who would keep a lookout for approaching enemies. And then a big gate, which is not there now, of course, would probably be heavy metal that they could open, raise or lower, probably open, you know, forward or backward to only allow those in who they wanted to. So this was the main entrance to the biggest city in at least the ancient Near East at the time and the capital of the largest, most powerful empire at that time. Okay, so let's do the stop share and we'll shift gears now to how to write your papers. I hope, uh, I think one or two people joined late and then I know I had a, a little glitch among many today uh, for some of you who I thought I'd admitted. So if you didn't hear me say this now, please do this. I did send this to all my students in all three of my classes yesterday. Sorry, I always have to remember. It's a three, uh, no five, I meant five requirements, sorry for, for your short papers. So we are gonna go over them one by one now and I'll answer all your questions. And then when we're done with that, we'll end probably several minutes early. Okay, so when you're writing your papers, I would have this with you. You don't have to, but it's my suggestion to all of you who wanna, you know, if you've never written an art history paper and certainly not with these exact requirements, obviously, because unless you took a course from me before, then you already know this. Okay, so um, 
the book, Sarah Gill's book, a uh, short guide, um, sorry, I meant Sarah Gill's book or the other one, a short guide to writing about art. That's recommended, but not required. One book is enough. And Sarah Gill's book is the best I've seen on how to write about the nine elements. We're gonna do that in class on Monday. It requires me to be standing for an extended period and use a pointer with a whiteboard here in my room. The whiteboard is already made out, it's ready to go, but I need to stay off my uh, toe for a while until it heals. And that was doctor's order. So next Monday, we'll cover those elements and then you'll have all the information that you should need to start working on your papers. You don't have to do it that soon, but if I were you, I wouldn't wait till the week before it's due to start thinking about it. Okay, let's go over these uh, elements one by one. I'll stop, I'll pause at the end of each of these five requirements and ask if there are any questions. Please do let me know if you have a question at any point. Okay, number one, you must have at least one full page on both, I put it in caps because that's important, both the meaning and the formal analysis. Please keep these sections separate and label them. Well, that's what you should be doing with your notes already. I covered that the first day of class. So what does that mean? I've gotten papers that were five pages long, much longer. The minimum is two pages. I just, I just said it by saying at least one full page. You, you could get an A, it's hard to do that with just barely the minimum. Usually three to five pages is what the A papers all come out to be. Now, I will mention this because I also sent you this. When I'm done with reading, going through these, I'll, I'll hold this up and just show you how this cover sheet works. You're gonna get those a week before the papers do. That's four weeks from now. So you have some time for three and a half. It's a sample paper you should have been able to download and either just look online at it or print it out. From a person who got an A with the full same requirements that they met and therefore they got a hundred points. Okay, so with number one, what, why do I even emphasize that? Because I get a lot of papers that are more than two pages, even you know several, and then they spend maybe four pages on the formal analysis, and then they give me half a page on meaning, and eh, they just lost a grade. No matter how well they wrote the rest of the paper, uh, uh, the formal elements, uh, uh, what they said about the meaning, that's not meeting the main requirement. It really does, just from all the years of experience from, from my students, uh, feedback. It, it takes a good solid page to do a decent job of describing the meaning of any work of art. And remember, meaning can apply to the context of the, the period and the culture it came from, the artist's life, and the third thing would be the actual meaning of that work. You should have something about all three in there, but in any case, you definitely need a full page to do a decent job. So if you give me the most detailed formal analysis of any paper this semester, but you give me less than a full page on meaning or vice versa, <laughs> you'll have points off and you'll already, before I even start grading the paper, it'll be down one grade from what it could be. So make sure that you have at least, what does that mean? Let's go to number two, defining what we um, mean. Yes, please go ahead now. Question. Sorry, could you um, just repeat categories under the meaning that we should talk about? You said culture, sure. context. Oh, yes. No, thank you. Thank you. That, that's a really important part of it. I'm going to do that with the other two. You're the first class I'm doing this review with this semester. Yeah, since so you're asking, what are three of the ways you can define or describe, I should say, the meaning in that section of your paper, or for that matter, on the essay questions of the um, midterm? The three main ways are the, the context by which I usually start each slide that, you know, the, the period of history and the culture from which that work of art was created. That's a context, right? The historical cultural context. The second thing you could do under the meaning section is something about the artist's life and, and you know, their experience, their, their, you know, background as an artist. And the third thing, every paper has to have this or else you, you won't get an A. Tell us what that actual individual work of art is trying to say. What was the artist's uh, message or, or, or meaning that, that they were trying to convey? And sometimes it's more than one thing. And so you see why it, it's going to take at least a whole page to just do a good job. I, I would give you a, guys a tip. I'm glad you brought that up. It's a, a perfect timing to say, do you have to do all three of those things to get an A and have maybe, you know, then at least two full pages for the meaning? as well and then whatever else you have on the form no if you give me at least two things that would be a good minimum 
that should get you to a full page. In other words, something about that work of art itself, that, that's got to be in any paper that is going to get an A. Of course, you know, what was this individual image trying to convey, right? And then either the artist's life or the historical context, because some of you are going to say, wait, uh, I see on the syllabus, we don't even have the name of most of these artists in the ancient world. That's true. So you can't write about the artist, but you sure can write about the history of the culture it came from and the context and the time and what that culture was like, because that influenced the, 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 the work of art, of course. And then the actual meaning of the individual uh, scene or object that you're writing about. I hope that's clear. That's a good point you raised. Anybody have any other questions on that? Yeah, so you're going to usually at least two of those three would be good. There is a fourth thing, but I guess we could mention it's called iconography. And uh, Sarah Gill's book goes into a detail on all these aspects of meaning, by the way. So that'll be another way to help you be clear by the time you're ready to write your papers. And iconography means the use of symbols. And so we've covered some of that, of course, certain things that symbolize uh, the ruler or who's the god and who's the king. That's called iconography. But see, that kind of overlaps into the, it's called the um, literal meaning or the scene itself. And de de uh, sorry, depicting, uh, <laughs> depicting, I'm trying to say two things at once, the uh, actual scene or describing, uh, it's a better word, describing the scene uh, is really a basic given, you know, what was going on. Now, if you're writing about an abstract painting, there might be less obvious meaning. Then you'll have to do some more research. Jackson Pollock, so you know he was, right? <laughs> Mr. Drip, <laughs> right? He dripped paint on the canvas or sl slashed it with uh, sticks dipped in paint buckets. That might not be obvious, but he usually had some underlying meaning. And if nothing else, this style, so actually, now that you think of it, I mean, that's you, you brought this up. I, I'm glad you did. You could then segue, if you don't know what the artist is trying to say, or he or she wasn't clear, it was just some kind of, it's called expressionist art, when you don't necessarily have a story or a message, but just your feelings are coming out. Well, then, if you can't determine what that artist's thoughts and feelings were by just looking at the work or from researching, then the least you could do is describe the style the artist was using. With Jackson Pollock, it's called abstract expressionism. So you could add that as one more aspect. But, but for this class and all the works we're covering in this class, the first three are more than enough. You know, If you know anything about the artist, describe the artist's life. If not, then, then, then give us the cultural and historical context. Uh, the actual meaning of that work of art itself, because you're not going to see abstract art in the ancient world. Well, sometimes there's a little, but they're not likely to, to write about it. And in this class, we're not covering any exceptions to the basic rule that all the works of art that were uh, in this syllabus on this uh, in this semester are going to have literal meaning, literally what's happening in that scene. And then you, you could talk about if you wanted to round it out and you don't know anything about the artist, what style is that work of art? Symbolism, it's kind of to me, it overlaps into the literal meaning because symbols tell a story and that's what you do when you describe the scene that you're writing about. I hope that's clear. Any questions? Now's the time to ask about that aspect. It gives you plenty of types of approaches to meaning. You don't have to do all of them, but at least two usually will get you to a minimum of a full page. Okay, so that, what do we mean when we say a full page? It's a straightforward definition. There's not any ambiguity. Number two of the five requirements is, the paper must be a minimum of two full pages in length and a maximum of seven. Please don't give me 10 page papers. Okay, double spaced. Here's what we mean by full page. Double spaced, 12 point typeface, 23 lines minimum. That's a full page. So again, I see a lot of papers where someone thinks they met that requirement. They start three or four or five lines down from the top because they put their name in the class and then they have two more lines where they space it. And then the title of the paper I and my readers are really experienced at knowing when something is a full page. If we have to, we do line counts. So if you give me, say, 18 or 19 lines on the first page and then go straight at the top of the second page to the formal analysis, again, you've already lost several points because it's not the minimum requirement is 23 lines. So that's a standard. I didn't set that standard. Pretty much college has been since I was in college, I think. When we is, yes, we used to use typewriters. <laughs> and I did the two finger type. 
I usually paid people to type my papers actually. So, so if you're using your laptop, it's easy to know how many lines. I don't go by words because the words can be very long or very short. It's the amount of lines. That should be pretty straightforward without any ambiguity. Anybody have any questions about this second item? Okay. And by the way, how do we know how many points to take off? It's a simple calculation. Yes, we use a calculator. Usually I have a small handheld one every time I grade a paper. And if I can tell it's less than 23 lines and I count how many it is and I do the math. What percentage did they under count or under uh, was, it, was this less than? And, and then you deduct that from the number of points in the total for the paper, which is 100. So you don't want to have that happen. So make sure you do at least 23 lines on both halves. Okay. All right, number three, this one, is usually not hard to meet, but I've every semester I get papers in each class where they don't meet all of these requirements for the illustration. The illustration must be at least four by six inches. That's a half page, not these little thumbnail things where you know at the top of a website, or you know, or even like a, a large postage stamp, you know, two inches by two inches. You can't see the detail of me or the readers to see did you cover all the elements thoroughly, unless it's large enough and also in color has to be in color. Uh, or, of course, if it was the original work was in black and white, then it's it's pretty obvious what you do is you say that in your paper, so I or the reader grading your paper will be clear that there weren't any colors in that work. Okay, and it must be clear. That's a big one. I get a lot of these muddy, I know, with certain kinds of internet connections or, or even printers, uh, whatever, you know, you're using to, to, to send me a color image of the work you're writing about it can get you know the colors can be distorted you know where everything was kind of yellowish or something that's points off because again we have to be able to see all the nine elements including the accurate reproduction of the original colors as close as possible of course and a clear sharp image for the modeling the details of the modeling and the cement texture and line so if it's if it's fuzzy out of focus or it's the colors are off it's already several points off you get partial credit um but again no reason you should be able to not i mean be, be able to to meet that requirement now the last two are the ones where more people miss points on their first papers if they've never done a paper like this than any of the other requirements so i'll, I'll make sure they're clear hopefully before we finish today number four bibliographies must include at least three new sources besides Stockstead and Gill. Of course, they're not new. They, they were the ones that came with, right, that you had to have. That They're not new sources. So at least three new sources. So you could have Stockstead and Gill plus those three sources, if you want to meet this requirement, would give you five sources. Okay, at least one of these new sources must be printed. Now, I've modified that and I said it, uh, I believe, well, I'm saying it now and I will repeat it before your papers are due when I send you the cover sheets that you'll need as a PDF to print it. Well, you know, yeah, you kind of do. Well, no, you could do it digitally, of course. Attach, I meant to say, attach to the body of your paper before you email it to me. We'll get to how to do that in just a few minutes. Okay, so once again, the bibliographies must have a printed source. Well, so, some of you are going to say rightfully so. Wait a minute. The libraries on campus, at least, aren't open. Most public libraries now are, but I don't expect you to go to the library and get a physical book. I mean, you, if, if you do, that's good. I mean, it would meet that requirement and be uh, very clear and unambiguous that you did because you'd put in parentheses print. But what if you can't do that? Then you can do the online version of an original printed source. And the best example is a very common one, Encyclopedia Britannica. In fact, someone told me that the only kind of uh, encyclopedia that's continuously published anymore I guess there used to be several that you could find in the English language. So Encyclopedia Britannica, obviously, well, it's not obvious. It, it starts out as a printed source, as do almost all magazines and newspapers. So if you're using what was originally a printed book, whether it's Encyclopedia, a single volume, whatever, or a magazine or newspaper article, you can say from original printed source. If you don't do that, we won't know for sure that it was. Uh, so you should do that. Uh, this is a modification, very minor, but not an important one, because you'd still get credit for having had three new sources, but there'd be a few points off that if it's not clear one of them was originally printed. Now, that's an important detail only because every point counts. So you're supposed to list in your bibliography, it needs to be labeled. Well, 
yeah, there we go. It's, it's right there. In front of, I forgot. I did update this. Yeah, I have so much on my mind now. Number four, it's right there. I said what I was just saying. Uh, they could be labeled uh, print to clarify they were originally published in print form. Okay, so I don't require you to go down to a library <clears throat> or, or pull a book off a shelf per se, but you do need to find a source that once was printed. The bibliography should be at the end of your paper and it needs to be labeled bibliography. If you say sources cited, I won't take points off the first time, but I will the second. That's not, there's two different things. Bibliography is a list, a detailed list of the sources you, you uh, chose to read. It doesn't mean you cited any of them in your text. That's something else. That's what number five is. So let's do both. And then I'm guessing you'll have questions to clarify what, what I mean by the difference. Bibliography is always got to be at the end. That's a given. And it should be labeled bibliography. And then it should have the numbered sources you read for that research or that paper. <laughs> Whether or not you cite them in the text is a separate uh, function. So let's do that, number five. You must cite at least two of the sources from me. It is a very minimal requirement for a college level paper. At least two of those sources uh, from your bibliography within the, I would underline that if you didn't already know this, uh, most of you do from even high school research papers, right? Within the text of your paper, that's what we mean by uh, sources cited. And how do you do that? Well, there's a couple of ways. Traditional footnotes, everybody knows how to do that. I'm not gonna go into the detail. The, at the bottom of the page, where you, anytime you have a quote, you should do this. Even if it's more than twice. It, some people really throw A papers off and have three or four or five even uh, uh, citations, either in a footnote at the bottom of the page, which you should know how to do that. It's pretty standard procedure since um, probably middle school, right? Uh, or you can do a shorter in-text citation, and that's where you put in parentheses the last name of the author of that book or article and the page from which that fact or quote came. Technically, I should be requiring you every time you cite any fact, and always, though, even in this loosely enforced rule in my class, you still have to do it, or if you want an A, or at least 100 points, whenever you have a quote. I mean, you should. You should say, where'd that quote come from? That, you know, of course, we'll know because the parentheses are around it. That is a quote from some source. And you should, at the end of that quote, either have a number for a footnote at the bottom, as everyone knows how to do that, or the in-text citation that we give you a break on, which is you parentheses, the last name of the author of that source. Or if it's a website, then I put it right down here, right? Wikipedia.com. And then don't just give me Wikipedia. There are millions of articles. You get no credit for that. That's not a citation. That's just mentioning that somewhere in that vast source you found a fact. You need to be specific if you use Wikipedia or any other website. Doesn't matter. Wikipedia is okay with me. Some professors have a bug up there, whatever, about oh Wikipedia. It used to be unreliable. It did, but it's now much much more thoroughly uh, sourced. If you don't know what I mean, take a look at a Wikipedia article from the last. Oh, 10 years since they started getting sued for putting false information out. They got sued and lost a big lawsuit, $10 million over, over where they weren't at that beginning of Wikipedia. It wasn't a reliable site. I would have told my students not to use it 10, 15 years ago, but now it is because they were forced to try and um, verify their sources within each article before they post them. The, the, the guy that owns it, I forget his name, got sued and lost $10 million. It's a lot of money, even though he could afford it, because he, he ran an article about Kennedy uh, being assassinated by one of his former speechwriters. <laughs> the former speechwriter had worked for the head speechwriter, Kennedy's best friend, and that guy said that his boss, who fired him for incompetence when Kennedy was president, we're talking about John F. Kennedy now, a long time ago, I know, he, that guy, the head speechwriter, they wrote, ask not what your country can do for you. Yeah. And then many other famous speeches that Kennedy gave, President Kennedy. He was accused of having been involved in the plot to kill Kennedy by a disgruntled ex-employee. And they posted it on Wikipedia without fact checking. So they got sued by that head speechwriter. His name was Schlesinger. He wrote several books about the history of Kennedy's presidency. And he won big time, hands down. That was slander, of course. And that's when Wikipedia did an about face. Okay, from now on, we're not posting anything that isn't thoroughly researched and documented. So you notice that if you've been using Wikipedia. And I don't know, other I've heard other professors are still down on Wikipedia as a source, but 
it's changed and it's perfectly acceptable. Don't just use one website though. Like in other words, again, hey, you're gonna have to have three different sources. But if you use any website and you don't wanna use footnotes, in-text citation could be like I wrote there, you see second line from the bottom, uh, wikipedia.com comma, and then the title of the article, the specific article. And then that'll show up in the bibliography. Uh, and of course it just say date access. Uh, people shouldn't already know this stuff, but if you don't, I have some helpful um, tip for you noodlebib.com i'll hold it up close because that's not in the version i uh, emailed everybody you see that there uh near the end well, at the end of the fourth item just like it sounds the word noodle bib bib.com is a source for finding out without having to go to a library well you can also go to the the uh, reference section of the library obviously not in person on campus either either at Loma or santa rosa campus and and do a search to find out how do i cite how about other sources besides books and websites. Can anybody think of any other sources you could, you could use? This is important because some of you will find different kinds of sources besides printed uh, or, or uh, website sources. What other sources could you use? Anybody? For any papers you've written, I'm sure some of you have, where you use something other than uh, text. Nobody can think of anything? <laughs> you guys are tired? A movie, maybe? Yeah, yeah, a documentary, a film or an interview with the artist. And that could be done online or over the phone. I doubt it'll be in person these days, but maybe it will be. How about class notes? Absolutely. For my class or any other class that has information about the history and the culture you're writing, the work of art came from that you're writing about. So you've got other sources that I don't have time to go into the details, how to use the MLA or you know college research paper format those standards and you can find them if you're using a source that isn't uh, you should already know how to cite a book or a magazine newspaper right or the websites I already briefly touched on that but if it's an unusual source like an interview or a um, documentary um, <clears throat> then you might want to consult either the noodle bib site i just mentioned or you can uh, access the library i'm sure you know how to google that for their research desk i think they call it and they'll tell you you'll know, you'll plug in what source you're trying to verify how to list it or cite it both in the bibliography and in the text um i i don't get too strict on that again people tell me i'm too lenient about that but if you list a book you know or something that originally was a book in your bibliography and you don't give me uh the city or the publisher or the year is published, you get a couple points off for each of those items that's missing because you're supposed to do it that way. So in case I want to go check or anyone later on reading your paper might want to check, that's the whole point. They can go straight to that source quickly. So you do need to have you know the right format. It's called MLA format. I know you've all heard that phrase. And uh, that's something you can either get from that Again, noodle bib, just I already spelled it for you, dot com website or on the library, the, the campus library's website. All right. Um, now, when we're done, first of all, any questions about the last two? Because the easiest thing, uh, I mean, the, not easiest, the most common thing, and I guess it is the easiest to overlook, is citing sources within the text. And right there, you already dropped uh, several points before, I even, if you don't do that. If you don't either have footnotes or in text citations at all, you could have the most thorough bibliography, a well-written paper on and meet the requirements on the illustration and still not get uh, you well, maybe get an A minus, <laughs> like 90, you know, low 90s. But why not aim for you know a perfect score or you know as high a grade as you can and not have points taken off like that when you can easily uh, avoid that uh, omission by following each of these rules. So are there any questions now about uh, the last two requirements? And then I'll, I'll summarize and we'll end a little early, about five minutes early, but I always stick around anyway for questions afterwards. Okay, so the last thing to say is, and I'll hold this up to the screen, that uh, there you see you're going to need to, um, okay, when you turn these in, you need to send them to me as a PDF at uh right my aol website which you know is you can do both if you want to to back up that's not a bad idea the, the campus website through outlook but it is much more cumbersome to 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 retrieve store re reference 
let alone delete items. And there's so much spam that comes through. Surprisingly, I'm getting solicitations for high school reunions from people in towns, cities, even states that I've never been to. No, I didn't graduate from Dallas High School in 2020. <laughs> Why am I getting it? Through the campus website. And my spam filter is better than that on AOL, much better. So I prefer that, but I have, will accept it on either one. But it's if you want to make sure it gets through to me and that I can grade it at the same time as all the others and get it back to you in a timely manner, please then send it to Mark W at AOL. I'm going to go ahead and hold up a sample of what that looks like at the time the papers do. It's still over three weeks away. So when that's ready, uh, it gets close. I'll be sending you the cover sheet. So let's wrap it up with this. This is what the cover sheet will look like. And you see it's a checklist. This is a very objective system. By the way, I give credit where credit's due as always anybody should do in academic uh, environments, which is Sarah Gale came up with this system and I've never seen a better one. It, it doesn't leave much to you know prejudice, bias, oversight, error. It's very objective, not subjective. You get three points for each of the nine elements that you correct. You should have this, right? I send it to everybody, sample paper. Uh, so you can look at it when you're working on yours and use it as a checklist. So if you miss three of these points, you're already nine points down. That's almost the whole letter grade. If you only give me six of the nine elements, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then also the meaning is worth 20 points. If you give me only half of a page, you'll get 10. There again, you just dropped a whole grade. Uh, and when you get to the um, bibliography, if you do it correctly and list three new sources, one of them from originally printed, and you use at least two of those sources in the uh, in-text citations, then you've got you know the full 20 points there. But it's pretty straightforward, this, this grading system. But you'll get this sent to you as a PDF where uh, a week before the papers do. Uh, so you don't you know have it sitting around and lose it uh, or misplace it for some reason or have the file disappear uh, i'll send it to everybody the week before and i will then uh it's too soon to do it now because it's more than three weeks from now uh, i will hold up a sample of what the labeling should say on the attachment and how so i know okay that's a paper from this student in this class and that would be a very specific set of uh, uh facts that will go into the label whatever you want to call that the box the label that i will then see when i get your email and know okay now that is one of those papers from x y or z class so i download them and start grading them and enter the grade in the right place in the right roster we covered a lot any questions anybody about anything we covered with the, with the grading procedures I mean, it's early still, but you should at least now with those two handouts, the sample paper, which you ought to, ought to read because it, then you see how your paper should look. It's a concrete example of how at the end of the process, when you're ready to submit it, your paper should have at least all those elements in it. It could be longer, but it would need to be. The sample paper, I believe, was, let's see, three pages, I think, right? That's just one, two, yeah, three pages. That's usually the minimum people can, uh, or near around three pages or four, maybe five, three to five of what I see most day papers are in that length. Not counting the bibliography and the illustration, of course. All right, one more time. Any questions, anybody? About anything now that we covered today? Okay. Well, thank you all for your persistence and patience. I hope you didn't think I wasn't gonna you know, send you the information to log on, but I almost wasn't able to. That shouldn't happen again. I, I can't imagine it would. But of course, we got a windstorm coming. You know about that? That could internet, affect the internet tonight. Zoom class. If you got a Zoom class tonight, be patient and the teacher. This is what I did when mine, that happened to me on Monday night. I just sent them all an email on my other line, my other computer. Give it 10 minutes and I'll start a new meeting. And that's what I almost had to do today. But you guys were patient. So thank you. Didn't need to do that. All right. One more time. Any questions from anybody about anything we've covered now or extra credit or anything else? Okay. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting. Uh, you're going to see next week we're going to cover uh, the culture that believed in snake goddesses and uh, the Minotaur. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And Atlantis. 
the lost continent of Atlantis? Was there a basis for that? I think there was. And I've been to where they think that might have been the basis, an island in the Aegean, a Greek island. Uh, you'll see that, including my own slides, of that island. It's called Santorini, if some of you may have heard of it. It's one of the most beautiful places on Earth. So we'll see you know, the, all the slides from the syllabus. And we will also cover probably on Monday, it should be Monday, the uh, how to, to uh, recognize the nine elements with an illustrated lecture. So then you'll know everything you need to know to, to, to write your papers. Okay, one more time. Anybody have any questions? Again, I'll check my emails regularly, assuming everything doesn't go offline again. I don't think that's likely to happen. All right, thank you guys. Take care. You too. Have a good one. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Mark. Take it easy. Yes, um, bye.